Welcome in to Locked on Knicks. Alex Wolf here going solo to break down the Knicks almost good, almost comeback 119 to 115 loss to the Chicago Bulls at home on Thursday night. Lots to talk about in this one. Julius Randle, another monster game. Mitchell Robinson, a monster second half. The shooters coming through when you want them to. Some more questionable officiating. And a lot more to talk about next on Locked on Knicks. You are Locked on Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked On Knicks. This episode is brought to you by Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Scaling your business is a journey of endless possibilities, so start now at shopify.com slash LockedOnNBA. I am Alex Wolf. I'm editor-in-chief of Knicks site, The Strickland, which you can find at thestrick.land. And as I said in the intro, I am recapping the Knicks 115 to one, or sorry, one nineteen to one fifteen loss to the Bulls on Thursday night, and it was uh, better than you might think because if if you just went off the first half, it was pretty awful. Uh, so the Knicks came into this game no RJ Barrett still still sick, non COVID related illness, which I guess is good in its own way, but. Uh, I don't know what's going on with him. Seems like maybe a flu of some sort or something. The fact that he was able to start the last game seemed okay and then had to leave. Maybe it's like a stomach bug or something. Uh, but hope, I mean, I hope he doesn't have a stomach bug this last a couple days. Anyway, enough speculating with that. Like, whatever it is, RJ was out for another game. Uh, no Nerlens Noel either. And that sort of came into play in this one. But I was kind of glad to see that Nerlens was not going to give it a go in this game because his knee has just been so bad lately it seems like it seems like anytime he's taken the court over the last couple weeks with that knee brace he he can't really move so i kind of just hope he gets it right at this point but uh that sort of led us to this this shorthanded knicks team as usual i mean what else is new uh one thing that's very different this year from last year is that the knicks were very fortunate on the injury front last year not run into too many this year not so much. Uh, you know, last year, obviously, you had Mitch out. But other than that, they they were pretty well uh, equipped health-wise. And it just hasn't been the case so far this year. Uh, but we ended up with a great Julius Randle game. Um, he ended up with a, a pretty impressive stat line overall. He had 30 points, 12 rebounds, 6 assists, 14 of 21 shooting overall. Not a single three, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, which is a little interesting. And some of the other guys came through with some good stat lines too, but I feel like I should probably get into just how terrible the first half was first, rip that Band-Aid off before then getting into the good stuff here. Uh, So the Knicks (laughs) first half and down 69-51 by the end of the first half. They were down by as many as 21. Uh, The Bulls had eight offensive rebounds, including some really costly ones towards the end of the half as the Knicks were sort of trying to claw back, you know, they, they fell down by that 21 point margin. And then I think the closest they got it in the first half was like 12, uh, in that second quarter. I think they managed to get it there once or twice. And, you know, you start to think, okay, comebacks coming and then boom, another three from the bulls or, you know, whatever, another DeRozan make or whatever the case may be. And things just it, were not going the next way. So that's why they end up going into the half. Uh, down 18 like that, which is not great. Uh, and they, but you know, again, the Knicks didn't do themselves any favors, like offensive rebounds right at the end of the half, which led to to Bulls uh, makes. They the Knicks executed a nice two and one sort of, and then allowed the Bulls to get a nice easy take on the inside, which then gave the Bulls actually a two and one because the Knicks made their their shot for their attempt at the two and one with around like 40 seconds left on the clock, which then. You know, the, the Bulls just quickly sprinted down and, and got their own shot. It's just a lot of costly errors. You know, uh, Emmanuel quickly and Alec Burks really did not shoot well in the first half. Uh, you could say they did all right, you know, for their other responsibilities, defense, playmaking, whatever the case may be. 
Uh, but shooting was terrible. I mean, they're one of 11 shooting zero of eight from three. And it's not like they were getting the free throw line or anything either. Just a terrible all around first half for them. And, you know, the, the process was okay and all that. That's fine. But it's just, it's such a backbreaker when you're starting to, you know, guards are putting up one of 11. It's just, it, it doesn't work out well in the grand scheme of things. Uh, Fournier luckily managed to put together a little something in the first half. So he, he gave some offense. Uh, Julius Randle though was the guy uh, as he would be for the whole game. 15 points, six rebounds, three assists. Wow. That's funny. I actually just realized he totally, he had exactly the same stats in each half, 15, six and three. That's kind of cool. Uh, on 7 to 12 shooting in the first half. And, you know, it was just, it was great play from Julius. He he was hustling like crazy. Uh, he was running the offense. I mean, I think that the one thing that we're seeing in a Kemba Walkerless Knicks lineup is that there's no question. This is Julius's lineup to run again. He's the main guy that you expect to be bringing the ball down the floor, or at least the guy that you expect to be initiating the action eventually to, you know, get other guys involved. And, he seems to be thriving with that, and that's a great thing to see. I mean, it's unfortunate that things didn't work with Kemba, and you know maybe the book isn't even totally closed on that just yet. But you know maybe they'll figure something out in practice or or what have you. But you know just the the way that Julius plays without Kemba on the floor is so much better, and it's really shown through these last few games. Even though the win loss record has not really been there, um, the the fact that the Knicks have been in as many tight games as they have been against legitimately good teams. I mean, you know, a, a two possession game today against the bulls and a one possession game the other night against the nets, which the officials straight up like announced that they screwed up on it is a pretty good place to be lately since the, the Kemba uh, benching also Mitch, you know, I'm going to mention how good of a second half that he had in a minute, but his first half was not great. No points, two rebounds, uh, negative 12 plus minus. He wasn't getting out on Vucevic, um, who eventually Vucevic wound up ending this game at five and nine from three. Um, and, and, you know, just not a, a great game from Mitch in that respect, no matter what. Uh, he just wasn't doing great at getting out on Vucevic. Tibbs and maybe also just Mitch and the team made some adjustments in the second half that really made a huge difference uh, for Mitch and made it so that his lack of like little burst out of drop coverage to get out to Vucevic wasn't hurting him quite so bad, but you know, it really hurt him in the first half and it, and it hurt the Knicks in general. And he just, he didn't have a great half. You know, he was, he was not playing as well as you want him to play. And it reflected in the minute total as well. He only had like nine minutes. Now, the other thing is that Taj Gibson, only played like three minutes. So again, I already mentioned they were down Nerlens Noel today. Uh, Jericho Sims wasn't with the team team either. I I think that he was just uh, sent down still because they're trying to preserve his G League minutes. But he might have he might have been hurt. I forget. I just saw that he was out prior to the game. I I kind of overlooked it. I forget if he was hurt or whatever. Uh, but Taj gets thrown out about three minutes into his stint in the first quarter. It was. I mean, I don't know why he got thrown out. And it it almost felt like a revenge call from the refs. I mean, Julius Randle and uh, uh, Tom Thibodeau didn't get fined for their comments about the officiating the other night. And it seemed like early on in this game that the refs came out was sort of like a vendetta. Like it was almost like a, a first, uh, considering like the first quarter to be like, all right, we're going to go extra tough. And then to be fair to them, I mean, I don't think they called a great game, but they at least called a relatively even game in the second half. Um, in the first like quarter, though, it just felt like, I mean, Breen was even noting it a number of times, which, you know, it takes a pretty good amount to get Breen very heated about officiating because he tries to call it down the middle. But there was a number of times, you know, some in the second half, too. I shouldn't even let them off the hook for the second half. But, you know, where, where the Knicks were getting a lot more contact on them than they were dishing out on the other end. And yet we're getting called for fouls on the other end and not getting foul calls on their end. And so Taj said something to an official. They teed him up once, and then he acted incredulous at getting teed up because I can't imagine he said anything that incendiary because it's freaking Taj Gibson we're talking about, you know, and he's not that type of guy. And then he gets a second tee and gets thrown out. And it was just, I 
I can't think of any other reason why that would have potentially happened unless it was essentially a revenge call. I mean, I, I don't, I don't get it. Um, but it, it was, it was really crappy. Um, I, I think the NBA's really got to figure out officiating, but that's sort of a big picture concern, but I think that they have to figure out, you know, how to make sure that teams are getting called evenly throughout these games with these new rules, because it seems like oftentimes there's double standards for one team versus another one player versus another. And I know the refs are trying to figure this out on the fly, but it needs to happen sooner than later because it's, it's clearly really affecting the players and, and frustrating them to no end that they don't know what a foul is anymore. And I feel like as a viewer, I don't often know what a foul is anymore either based off some of the criteria that they're calling or not calling things on right now. So the Nets game was a prime example. This game was another prime example. And ultimately another one that the Knicks lost by, by so little that it makes you wonder that, you know, if things were different uh, and, and a couple calls went a different way, could they have potentially won this game? Uh, I don't know. I, there's no way to know for sure, uh, unfortunately, because it's not like you get a redo. Uh, but at any rate, I want to talk about the second half more because the second half was a lot better. Obviously, the Knicks made this roaring comeback, which I'll I'll get into a bit. First, I do just want to let everybody know that today's episode is brought to you by Shopify. And uh, I don't I don't have the, the sound effect inserted here, so let me just imitate it. Cha-ching! <laughs> I love that sound. That sound makes me smile. It's the sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. In case you don't know, Shopify is a complete commerce platform that lets you start, grow, and manage a business. The subscription-based software allows anyone to set up an online store and sell their products. Shopify store owners can also sell in physical locations using Shopify POS, our point-of-sale app, and accompanying hardware. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility, and Shopify helps you make your entrepreneurial dreams come true. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources to make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers over 1.7 million businesses from first sale to full scale reaching customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. It allows you to gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. So go to shopify.com slash LockedOnNBA, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash LockedOnNBA right now. Shopify.com slash locked on NBA. And today's show is also brought to you by Truebill. Do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill want, makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. And, you know, I tell you, I love Truebill. I, I accidentally was sub to, you know, you, you end up sub to a million different subscriptions for video watching services and whatever. And when you sit there and you actually do the math, you're like, man, I'm paying how many dollars? And, and I'm paying for this service that I'm not even really utilizing anymore. It, it was very helpful for those things. And, and I managed to trim the fat on my monthly bills quite a bit. Truebill has over 2 million users and has helped save them over $100 million. So don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now, Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. All right, so I am back here, and you know the Knicks might have been using Truebill a little bit because they certainly trimmed the margins a bit uh, on their their crappy defense and their <laughs> listless offense. I guess maybe that that now she doesn't quite work. They uh, they amplified them. I don't know. They, <laughs> whatever spot they took a built bar. I don't know. I'm not being paid to talk about them today. Anyway, the defense tightens up in the second half for the Knicks, and it was like night and day. You know, they only give up 50 points in the second half. They won the third quarter 32 to 20. That 
third quarter of doom flipped completely on its head. Third quarter of, of prosperity instead of the third quarter of doom. And then the fourth quarter, they win 32 to 30, ultimately coming up four points shy. I, I thought that Mitchell Robinson really helped turn things around. And, you know, I, I already said I, I didn't like his first half. I thought that he wasn't making good reads. And especially the Vucevic thing was a huge problem. Uh, you know, and it didn't, if you just look at the numbers, it didn't really get better in the second half. But, you know, Vooch hit a couple shots early in the third quarter that Mitch gave up. And then from there, Mitch just like the light bulb kind of clicked. And he started, it, it wasn't just that he looked better. The scheme for the Knicks got better. So they stopped being quite so afraid of switching off of the shooter or, you know, off the ball handler, I should say. And stop playing such heavy drop coverage. So what happened was Mitch was sort of playing drop, but then would come up to the ball handler and and his, you know, and the the ball handler's man would switch to to Vooch, which was fine because like Vucevic wasn't trying to go inside at all, really, in this game. He pretty much was living at the three point line. Like his total uh attempts here, he wound up taking throughout the whole game 18 attempts. Nine of them came from three. So he took half of his attempts. And then the other ones were pretty much all jumpers inside the line. I, I really don't think that he took, if he took more than two attempts at the rim in this whole game, I would be really surprised. So he was not trying to play like big man style. Uh, whereas Mitch, you know, was very much tasked with guarding the interior because a lot of times those ball handlers on those possessions were like Zach Levine or DeMar DeRozan or even like Lonzo Ball or Alex Caruso who were all just trying to, break the defense down. And then a lot of times, you know, once they sort of broke things down, Mitch has to cover the middle to try to, you know, protect against them driving, but then they would kick it out to, to Vucevic and then, you know, Mitch and, you know, Levine or DeRozan or whoever's man would essentially be, you know, double teaming Levine or DeRozan. Then that led to these wide open threes for Vucevic. They corrected that by starting to switch the guards over. So, you know, Fournier would switch over to Vucevic, and that was enough to bother him. And it, you know, it didn't result in a ton of turnovers. Like, Vucevic only had one turnover, but he made a number of plays that were sort of like panic plays out of that, you know, where he was either taking like a more rushed shot, so he would miss one, or he was, you know, making a a so so pass that maybe didn't result in a turnover, but didn't really advance the offense at all. And stuff like that. So it worked out pretty good for the Knicks in that respect. And it was a way to sort of stop a hot shooter from being quite as hot as he was. Because, you know, Vucevic is one of the the rare stretch bigs that's actually good at shooting. Um, so, I mean, I really liked what, what Mitch did in the second half. And unfortunately, he kind of like died <laughs> with about like four minutes left to go. I, I haven't looked at the, the math yet on how long he played in that stint. But I think that he played roughly like 10 straight minutes, uh, maybe even slightly longer. So his conditioning just kind of gave out on him. And, you know, I got, I've got i gotten into some some debates like that in um, the Strickland's Discord. We had a bit of a debate going about Mitch and what we should be expecting from him at this point. And some people are starting to sort of, uh, you know, turn over on him a bit and be like, you know what, like, I think it's been long enough. You know, he's, he's still dogging it. He's not giving consistent effort. He's not giving consistent, you know, engagement and, you know, making the right plays enough and blah, blah, blah. That's fine. I still think I'm all right with him getting tired down the stretch of a game where he played 10 straight minutes and played really good uh, in those 10 minutes. I'm all right with him still having some mental lapses because I think there's still some disconnects between what his body is capable of now versus what it used to be. And like he's still getting used to playing basketball again, quite frankly, because, you know, he wasn't really able to play much. Uh, before the start of the season. So this is essentially like, you know, if the Knicks are 22 games into the season, this is like game 23 for him that he's been able to play in the last like six months. Uh, Cause he didn't really get to play much of last year. Thanks to those freak injuries. So I'm still willing to be patient with him And this half. I thought was, you know, hopefully a sign of things to come. Hopefully it was like the light bulb moment for Mitch where now he's going to be playing a lot better uh, going forward. And then Julius Randall too. Um, I, I think was just really, really good. Um, I, I would say, you know, I've said this a few times, but this is arguably his best game of the year. What I really liked about him was that he was, he was not forcing things. He was just doing what was coming to him. And, you know, he was really able to get inside and take advantage of the matchups presented to him. 
Um, he had Javante Green on him a bunch, and I mean, he just he took him to the woodshed. I mean, he he was abusing Devonte Green in this game. It was not even close. Like he just it, it seemed like every time that Mitch got that one on one matchup, he you know or Mitch, uh, sorry, Randall got that one on one matchup. He was just like you know busting out whatever move he had to to get a bucket, but it never seemed particularly hard for him. He hit a couple mid rangers. He just got straight to the hoop a few times. Um, I'm actually really impressed that, I mean, Randall ended up with a final shooting line of, uh, what was it, 14 of 21. And I actually, I was surprised to see that he hadn't even, like that his shooting percentage was that high because in the first half especially, he had a number of, of those like mellow type shots where he didn't make the first attempt at the rim and then would jump up, grab his own rebound and get a putback right away which, you know, probably inflated the rebound stats a little bit. But, I mean, the second half, he was 7 of 9 shooting, and, and it didn't feel like he missed a single thing because he was just – he was on it. And, I mean, his shot selection was beautiful. He was only taking him from his comfort zones. He was getting to the inside. He was just kind of, like, bullying his way in there. And uh, it, it was a beautiful thing to see. And, and it just continued to play really well. It, you know, people online, I think, were being – a little harsh on him. I mean, I understand there's been crunch time issues with Julius before uh, dating all the way back to his first season. I mean, I, I, I tell a story I've told a story before on here, I think where one of my earlier, actually it might've been my very first game that I got to cover the Knicks for sports illustrated where I got to like sit on press row and whatever. I was sitting next to Malika Andrews before she like blew up, which was pretty cool. And you know, Julius had that that high pressure free throw at the end of a game with Indiana, which was also Mike Miller's first game coaching, and the Knicks lost by one point off of a Randall miss free throw. And like I had had Malik Andrews go, "Oh, you think he's going to make that?" And I was like, "No, he's not going to make that." And that's sort of followed him around since then. You know, it's been sort of his rep with the Knicks is like high pressure free throws sometimes are an issue for him, and sometimes he makes high pressure shots. Uh, down the stretch as well, but free throws in particular are really hard for him, it seems like, uh, in pressure situations. And, you know, fine, whatever. Like, if you want to blame him for the loss, then sure, but I think it's pretty impossible to blame a guy that was the only guy that brought it for all 48 minutes in this game and, uh, you know, ultimately played 39 minutes for you, 30, 12, and 6, 67% shooting. Like, the, sorry, but the Knicks aren't anywhere. They're not even in a position to win this game without him you know, dumping in a third of their points practically. So, you know, I, I I think that, you know, it's forgiven. You know, Julius had a, a tough end to the game, missed the key free throws, had a key turnover late as well, where he sort of, you know, got stripped. I think it was by Caruso. Um, but hopefully he's he's able to just put that under the bridge lately. It seems like he has been able to. There's been some really frustrating finishes to games for the Knicks lately. And yet Randall is the one guy that seems to be coming out with 100% intensity lately. So I think things will turn around for him and for the Knicks soon enough. And hopefully they'll start playing full 48 minutes uh, between all of them that, you know, lead to wins. And, you know, Julius not needing to make clutch free throws down the stretch. Maybe the Knicks can play a game that's not a heart attack risk one of these times. Uh, But when we get back, I'm going to talk a little bit about Fournier, Burks, and IQ in the second half. They combined for 30 points. 11-24 11-24 to 24 shooting, 7-13 to 13 from 3. Definitely a great half for them. Uh, but I do just want to remind everybody that today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline.ag. BetOnline has you covered all season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football season continues to march to the playoffs. BetOnline remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head to the new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code Locked On and you'll receive your 50% welcome bonus. From basketball, football, the NHL, boxing, and the UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. All right, so continuing on, uh, I know I promised to talk about the guards. I did just want to quick talk about Obi, though. Uh, Obi, despite Taj getting thrown out wrongfully in 
one of the greatest crimes in the history of basketball. Uh, Obi only got 19 minutes, which was kind of frustrating. I don't know. It, it's weird. Like the more I'm looking back at it, you know, Mitch played almost 30 minutes. Julius played 39. So I guess it's, if you're thinking about it, you know, if you do the math there, I guess that's like what, 18 minutes without Mitch uh, and 10 minutes. So, I mean, in theory, there should have been like 28 minutes and then you subtract five for what Taj played uh, or, I guess he only had like three or four. So, but whatever, you know, so you end up with maybe there should have been about five more minutes that Obi could have played. And I, I just feel like that would have been a great use of time. And I'm actually kind of struggling to think what the lineups were that didn't include Obi that made it so that he got left out of those five minutes. But like in 19 minutes, again, he's so efficient on a per minute basis Eight points, four rebounds, two steals, four six shooting in 19 minutes. I just I don't understand how you're not playing this guy more. I know you know the the Bulls. This this kind of was a great matchup for it. You know, really that like they tried to go when Mitch was out and Vooch was in. They did try to kind of like post Vooch on Randall, but he was able to defend him well enough. And I I feel like Obi and and Randall probably could have handled things on the inside against pretty much any lineup that the Bulls would have thrown out there. So I, I don't know why they didn't go to it a little more. Um, but it's just one of life's great mysteries, I guess. But yeah, Obi had a really good high energy game as usual. I know nobody's surprised at that. Um, Emmanuel quickly. Now I'm getting to the guards. He finally found the range uh, in the second half and, as usual, found his mojo at like just the time that the Knicks needed him to. Um, in the third quarter, he hit back to back threes to get the Knicks within three points. And like, I don't know, it seems like almost every game quickly is put in this sort of situation where he has to make this like high leverage three pointer. And we've seen him take his lumps and not make some of them. You know, like some of them have been real backbreakers where he's been sort of tasked with making a big shot late and can't make it. Like, this game was another example, you know, one of the late possessions IQ kind of got the hot potato and did not have a great look at it. And through a he he had to like adjust himself in air to try to move over a foot and that doesn't really work. And so he wound up just having to kind of chuck something up there, which I don't think that one was his fault. But, you know, we've seen other situations where he gets a clean look late and, you know, sometimes he misses it. But in this game, he was definitely I mean, and seems like most of the times lately when he gets called on for clutch shots, he's just like, got it regardless of how good or bad he's been that night. He just like finds it in himself to make a big shot that you need. Uh, And in this case, it was, he brought the Knicks within three. And then of course we get to Alec Burks, like same deal. He, you know, had a terrible game shooting the ball, quite frankly. Uh, But then right when you need him to make a three pointer in the fourth quarter, you know, big money, a B fourth quarter Burks, pops out and makes, uh, you know, a, a three to tie the game off the dribble, one that he probably didn't have any, you know, any, like, business making considering how bad he had shot prior to that and yet makes it anyway uh, just because, just because he's big money AB and that's what he does. And then Fournier, like, also almost the same deal. Like, he had three, uh, three pointers in the third quarter to keep the comeback alive. Like, the Bulls kept trying to kind of keep it, you know, at arm's arm's reach, you know, 10 points, 12 points, like double digits, whatever. And they kept succeeding for a bit, but Fournier just kept being that guy that just kept being like, oh, no, you want us to be not in single digits anymore? Well, too bad. Like, I'm going to make this three, and you're going to have to deal with it. And they were, of, you know, there's a couple different varieties for him, too. Um, mostly it was that he had really good sidestep threes in this one. Like, I think two of his makes in the third were both of the sidestep variety. And uh, one was just sort of like a, a nice spot up where he got freed up by an off ball screen and all of them looked really pretty. Um, he had a, all in all, a, a pretty decent game for himself. Uh, his total stat line was six of 14 shooting four, 10 from three, 16 total points, four steals. And he actually, I mean, for all of his defensive deficiencies that he has, sometimes he, he did pretty much earn those steals. Like some of them were nice strips on guys trying to get inside Whatever, like I thought, I thought he had himself a pretty good game. And what's nice is that his two man game with Randall is really starting to come around. I think, and hopefully they can keep building on that because 
they do still, I think, have the chance to be like a souped up, you know, Randall and and uh, Bullock from last year. But they have to keep working at it. And, you know, they have to get this timing down. And Fournier, luckily, lately seems to be getting rid of his his tentativeness as well, at least enough that, you know, he's starting to finally make some shots and whatnot. Um I think uh, one thing that I've noticed with this too, you know, the, the team really needs to just stop going cold all at once for whole halves at a time. Like if they weren't so cold in the first half, and, and this speaks to offense and defense, you know, the communication wasn't great on defense, which I think was a result of the fact that none of the shots were going in on offense. And then go figure the second half happens and the shots start going in and they went freaking crazy. So I think you know, and, and almost came all the way back from over 20 down and won this thing. So just a little more consistency out of the starting lineup. And, and I, I won't even just say the starting lineup anymore, just out of everybody in, you know, whole halves in general or whole quarters, you know, it's even, we can make it even a little more micro. It, it just like, it always seems like there's a whole quarter or a whole half where this team just can't hit anything. And, it always puts them in these holes that they have to climb back out of. And, and that's got to change soon. Um, also a, a fun misleading plus minus of the night. Derek Rose was a minus 14 for a team low, but I thought he was great. I thought he was really key to the comeback effort. He made a few of those like really impossible floaters in the third and maybe also fourth quarter that you just like, you look at it and you're just like, how did you do that? Like he'll be like sort of falling sideways out of bounds like and still managed to just like flip up this nice little floater like so many things like that that he did that were just super impressive in this game so i i don't buy his minus 14 i think he was just out there for some bad times as far as chicago being kind of hot and then like you know like burks and and quickly got to be out there together a little more because they started together stuff like that so his normal running mates he didn't get quite as much time with things of that nature. Kevin Knox played like four minutes randomly in this game in the first half. Like, I don't know what the hell that was, you know, so that it's just, you know, Rose was just kind of in a weird situation this one. But anyway, uh, I think I'm ready to start wrapping this one up. Um, but, you know, the Knicks now they're back to 500 and I'm going to list off a whole bunch of games in a row here just so that everybody can be reminded, like the Knicks have probably their most winnable stretch of games of the whole season coming up and they really need to, take advantage because it's almost a quarter of their season. They have 18 games coming up. So by the time that this upcoming stretch is done, they will have, or I should say their next 19 games, including the Nuggets on Saturday. By the time these games are done, they will actually be at the exact halfway point of the season. And it's going to probably say a lot about how things are going to go for the back half because the back half of the schedule is quite a bit harder. But they have coming up, Denver on Saturday, which is a 1 p.m. start. So there's there's really no excuse for coming out flat against a team that's coming over from mountain time that to them it'll feel like 11 a.m. So, I mean, the Knicks better come prepared for that Saturday game. Um, but then after that, I'm going to list these off. San Antonio, Indiana, Toronto, Milwaukee, Golden State, those two games, obviously very tough. Uh, Houston, Boston, Detroit. Washington, Atlanta, Minnesota, Detroit, OKC, who just lost by like 75 points tonight. It was terrible. Toronto, Indiana, Boston, Boston again, and San Antonio again. I mean, that is a lot of games against not the the creme de la creme of opponents, as my cat agrees with me. Uh, and, and, you know, they just really need to come out on top out of these games here because it's it's going to be the most winnable stretch they have before their really long road trip uh, out to the West coast. And also which, yeah, that doesn't fall in this. They're going to have a long West coast trip and then a lot of really tough games to end the season that are going to kind of be make or break for how they fare as far as playoff seating and stuff like that. So coming out of this next stretch of 19 games with, I would say an overwhelmingly winning record, like three or four games above 500, I think is going to be very necessary for the Knicks to sort of catapult them into the second half of the season. But they made it through this hell stretch and they're still 500. And I can remember a time when Gavin and I were talking about they might come out of this, this hell stretch under 500 so that they're almost out. I mean, I guess technically speaking, they could lose to the nuggets on Saturday and that would put them under 500 and that would be a nice little screw you to me. 
for saying this, but I think that they've done pretty good to this point. They're definitely figuring things out, but we need to start seeing some wins rather than just moral victories because the moral victories only go so far, especially for a team that that came into the season with very real uh, playoff aspirations. So that's it for this episode of Locked on Knicks, though. Uh, I'll be back with one more episode. I'm going to put out a Saturday episode, even though technically we've put out five this week. The Kemba one where about him benching was sort of a shorter episode. So I'm going to try to put out one more thing uh, on Saturday, perhaps even just a, an immediate game reaction to the Nuggets game since it's early. So something to listen to for Sunday for you guys. Uh, at any rate, thanks for listening. And uh, I'll be back one more time this week and then plenty more. We got five days a week, every week uh, on Locked on Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. Peace out, everybody. Talk to you all soon.